So this week we thought we'd do something a bit different, but also linked to a previous episode. So back in episode 65, which was your money and decades, we talked a bit around in your 30s, how you can get a pay rise. You, you, your salary seems to increase, but then also your cost of living seems to increase, which is generally by choice, I think, for most of us. Um, so what that's called is lifestyle inflation. Now, I know we're hearing a lot about inflation at the moment, but this is slightly different because it is sort of self-inflicted as, as we go through. So this is our tendency to increase our spending as our income goes up. And I wonder if many of us have had experience of that. So on the sofa today, I'm joined by Emily and Jennifer and Julie. So hello to you all. Hello. 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 So I wonder, ladies, does anybody have any familiarity with lifestyle inflation? Hell yes. Absolutely. I, when I think back to episode 65, and it was that thing in your 30s you meant to be paying down debt. And I'm like, I think most of us spend our 30s accumulating more debt. And I know that if you think your first job probably doesn't pay that much, does it? No. And then a few years down the line, maybe you start to get pay bumps and you just enjoy it that much, don't you? And so, and it's funny because in the episode with Ruth talking about financial well-being, she used the example of cream, didn't she? Face cream. Mm. So, you know, you might use the one pound eighty nine one from Superdrug, and then you get the big pay rise, and maybe then you're going into Boots and you're looking at the Clarins and the Clinique stuff. So, I think that's that's a perfect example, isn't it, of it? Mm. Also, it's. I don't know if anyone else has done this, but in my younger years, I used to sometimes read the odd glossy magazine. That is a nightmare for lifestyle inflation because you only have to sort of read to see here what the celebrities are using on their skin, you know, to get rid of the wrinkles or have to wash their hair. Or, and that's, that's when you think, oh, yeah, I could try that. Yeah, I'd try that. And then, yeah, before you know it, you've, you're on your second bottle and you think you can't live without it. Whereas, actually, if you don't buy the magazines and you're oblivious as to how the other half live, you could actually just get along quite nicely with your super drug or your boots own shampoo or moisturizer i think you're, you're really that's really key emily because i think social media and consumer advertising around us shows us that as you get older you're supposed to buy more expensive things i don't know if that's just me but the the adverts seem to be targeted as getting more expensive as as magazines or targeted adverts go for older generations and it's almost mm. a, it is a bit like keeping up with the Joneses because they, those people who earn or well, that age who earn that you know level of income buy those things. That's what we feel we need to do. Uh, so, what's your view on that, Jennifer? Do you feel that that's something that you've seen? Oh yeah, all the time. I think that we're all fall victim to it ourselves to go. Oh, we'll maybe look at getting you know a different car or even changing just down to what foundation or anything like that. Certainly, in the clients that we see, absolutely. By the time it comes to you know, their remortgage, if they've maybe had a pay rise within that time, they're not sitting there with a, those kind of surplus funds in their bank. They have went and they went either on a massive holiday, which, you know, don't get me wrong, we all need to have holidays within that time, or they've got a bigger car and they've usually then increased their monthly commitments because they feel that they're at an okay level. Yeah, and I expect you see that quite a lot with mortgages, isn't it? You know, that is the, the big thing for oh, you because you're looking at people's expenditure... In, over periods of time and very rarely does anyone come and say oh I've got a pay rise and I've made all these overpayments so mm -hmm. we've tried and phone clients a bit more throughout the year anyway so that at least it's in their head for that um, but if not look, that money's gone and it's spent so it means that see if things do change like it is just now either with inflation or with the interest rates they don't have that available whereas if they hadn't done that they would have been really quite comfortable yeah, it's one of the principles of the fire movement isn't it that we talked about a few episodes ago is that, you know, don't ever let this lifestyle creep happen. And every extra penny that you get should be going into the into the forever lifestyle fund rather than being spent on, you know, an upgraded version of something. Yeah, that's how people do manage to have early retirements and get seem to get this financial freedom that they, they want. But yeah, it's a killer, this, this creep, if you want to try and do that. I think it makes us less resilient to any shocks and I think particularly right now there are many people who are facing 
shocks of different types, you know, depending on, on what you do and where you live. But you don't have those resources behind you to help you when something comes out of the blue. And as we all know, life likes to do that, whether it be self-inflicted or whether it be, you know, government announcements or or whatever might go on in the world. I think we all we all have the shocks that go with it. I mean, Julie, have you seen this sort of happening with your clients? Or with you? Not so much with my clients, because they're obviously very smart people because they went and hired a financial advisor. Me being a financial advisor, it's a bit like a builder. My house wasn't always <laughs> in the best of shapes. And when I think back to my earlier career, when I earned more money, my first thought was I can buy more stuff. And that's just that's just how it went. And that was to do with my own mindset and relationship with money. So I didn't understand that money was something that I could hold on to and that I could keep and that I could build. So when more arrived, that just meant I could do more things. And then something happened to my 30s. Towards the end of my 30s, I will own up. I can't, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I got a big pay rise when I had a proper job. And do you know, I think it's probably because I've become a parent. So that things had to change then and becoming a parent. So I'd got this pay rise and I'd worked out how much extra that meant I would have a month net. Because it's all right seeing the pay rise and it's the big number and it's gross. But what does that actually mean to me on a monthly basis in my pocket? And I thought, here's an opportunity. If I don't think about this money, it will just get swallowed up and it will disappear and it'll be as if I never had a pay rise. So, and I think the word I want to throw in here for people is when you do get a pay rise, it's about being intentional, being intentional about what you want to achieve with that money. And so I thought is, well, I still want to kind of have a bit of fun. So the net extra amount I was getting each month, I thought, well, I'll, I'll keep a third of that for me to just buy more expensive face cream or whatever it is that was ticking my box at that point. And the rest of it, I have to do some, some, something sensible with. So what did I do that was sensible? I went and bought a critical illness plan <laughs> because I just had a kid and I had, I had all the other insurance and I just thought, right, this is the gap in the portfolio. Go and get that boxed off and then start investing the rest of it. So some of it went into a pension. I think some of it went into an ISA. But it, the difference there is I was starting to be intentional about my money, which it hadn't occurred to me to do when I was younger. Which I think is a great example of having a, you know, having a bit of something that you want and then doing the, the sensible thing after. And do you think that you sort of thought about that in terms of financial goals you had for the future or was it just what you instinctively thought you should do? What, the, the, the sensible money stuff that yeah I yeah the, the pension and the investment was did you have particular goals in mind or was it because obviously with your background what you did okay the getting the critical illness was intentional and definitely goal orientated because I knew it was a gap that I had the money that went into the pension and investment I've got to be honest I just did it because I know that's something you're meant to do I did I've, I've already confessed I didn't get intentional about my pension until I was in my mid-40s so doing it in my 30s that was just a bit of good luck on my part but it, it does too honest no no I think honesty is great but it does show that you you know even though that wasn't the initial thing you did get there and I think people will do that whether they they work with a financial advisor they're probably more guided towards doing that but if you're not I think really establishing what your financial goals are and what you want to do in the future does help you decide what to do with your money now so I think that's really important all right can we can we play a game okay <laughs> that I've just invented on the spot now everybody looks really scared okay so Jennifer do you want okay. to play the game? I think I have to. <laughs> All right. I want you to imagine that you're 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 an employee for a big company and you've just had your yearly appraisal and it's really good news. They're dead happy with you and they're going to give you a pay rise. So you're getting an extra £7,000 a year. What are your first thoughts? I would probably, I'd probably pay down some debt and then I'd think, where am I going on holiday? All right. Because I think that, you can't you can't save it all because then you don't get the joy of the hard work you've got. So I would think, right, pay stuff down or give myself a safety net and then go on holiday. 
All right. Emily, you also have just been given a £7,000 pay rise. What is your first thought? Similar to Jennifer, I would, yeah, I'd make sure I didn't have any credit card debt hanging around. And then I would probably siphon off a few hundred pound a month into my pension and think about getting that tax relief on that. And then if there was anything left, I'd stick it in my emergency fund, which would probably ultimately be spent on a holiday as well. (laughs) Because the holidays are an emergency, aren't they? (laughs) I will be revisiting the purposes of an emergency (laughs) fund in future episodes. And Michelle, if I was to give you a £7,000 pay rise, what's your first, your very first thought? I'd like to say that I'd be sensible like Emily, but actually the first thing that came into my head was I could go on holiday and, oh, actually, maybe I should think about paying off any debt that I have first. So I probably did it the wrong way round because the holiday definitely sprung into my head first. I know what you can do. You pay off your credit card and then buy an expensive holiday and put it on the credit card. <laughs> Well, it's funny because I asked Instagram because that's where I go anytime I want to know the answer to anything. And those of you that responded to me, so there were quite a few of you where the shoes and handbags getting spent. A special shout out and mention to Trisha, who very sensibly replied to the question, what's the first thing you're thinking about? She goes, how much tax will I have to pay? Uh, like So Trisha isn't a financial advisor, Trisha works in housing. But I think that's a valid point because when you see how much you're going to get paid, you're like, oh, big number. But it's, let's sit down and work out, you're not getting to keep all of that number, the government are having some of it. So the number's much smaller than you think. And I don't know if maybe, because you see the big number, it can lead you being a bit more extravagant than mm. if you actually net it down. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it's always a bit of a shock when you get that first pay slip, isn't it, after having had the pay rise. What, what, how much, what? And the, obviously the really critical point is when you go over that 50,000, because obviously then you're nearing that you you've probably gone into the higher rate tax bracket, which you probably you might not have factored in. And also if you've got children and you're taking child allowance, well, that starts to get clawed back as well. You might not know it until the end of the year when the te- when the tax man says you owe money. But yeah, it's at that point, I think, that when you work out how many pennies of that extra pound you're getting to keep, it's a lot less than you think. I do also think that with the life, you know, with the lifestyle inflation, you're reducing your financial flexibility, aren't you? And I think that's really, you know, can seem really nice in the short term because you can do all these lovely things you want to do. But when you think about it over a lot, you know, long term. So I've had friends who've done this in their 20s. They've they've had a boost of salary and they've earned this money and they've bought this nice car and they've bought all the nice things in their house. And then when they've got children, they want to plan for their children. They want to put money away. And their words are, but I didn't save any of that money. And now I've got the extra resource of the child as well as trying to save Mm -hmm. and do these things for them. And I think I always try and think of it in terms of flexibility. I can be flexible with that money. So, yes, I could do something nice one off. Like, obviously, the holiday was the first thing that came to my head. But actually, does that give me flexibility in other areas of my life? And how can I be mindful about what I do with those other things? Mm. That- that's, that's why I think it's always a good idea to think about putting your money in a lot of places. Like someone, somebody says to me, should I pay off my mortgage or should I invest it in my pension? Well, why can't you do both? Because, you know, a little bit in every pot will grow over time. That's what I always think. Don't ever think there's just one strategy. There's a lot of strategies you should be doing all at the same time. Oh, you're singing from my hymn sheet, Emily, with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I said something sensible. Do I get a big tick for that? Every week. Every <laughs> week, there's pills of wisdom from you. So if we're talking about how to beat this lifestyle inflation thing, then what, what tips have we got for people? First one that would spring to my mind, and this is probably quite a, it's not just a financial one, is Try to avoid comparing yourself with others because we all lead different lives. We all have different goals which are important to us. And as as much as it might be really important to go, well, they've got that car, I want that car, actually their goals may be completely different to yours. They, They may have achieved what they wanted to achieve, but you haven't yet. So that's a very hard thing to do, I know, because as human beings, that's what we do. We compare, but trying to get yourself in that mindset that actually, no, 
their life is their life. This is my life. And this is what's right for me. I don't need to compete with them. Yeah, they have completely different priorities. I have a friend who, you know, she looks immaculate, buys all the latest fashions. She drives a nice car, has a nice house. You know, on paper, I could be, I could let myself be extremely jealous of her. But I know she has no pension and I know she's going to be working up until probably age 68 since they're probably going to be moving the state pension age. So she'll be working until 68 and I will have the option to be able to retire from hopefully touch wood 55, no, at least 60 maybe. But yeah, I, that's something to look forward to. And I just think, if you know, I'll be lying on the beach and she'll be <laughs> stuck in trolleys or shelves. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, no, but my tip, though, would be to siphon away that money, get that standing order set up. As soon as you get that pay increase, get that increased amount put straight into another account that you can't touch very easily. Mm, you like that one. What about yourself, Jennifer? Because I'm going to guess there's a conversation you have a lot, with, especially with younger people. Yeah, I would probably say, realise a bit earlier that stuff doesn't usually bring you happiness like buying the extra things doesn't actually add an awful lot of value to your life and then normally to allocate percentages of it so you still if you get a pay rise you'll probably allocate some of it for fun money because that is needed and then some into you know long-term investments or your pension particularly if you're over that kind of fifty thousand mark and then into repaying your mortgage debt because that tends has such an emotional hold over most people and see if they can keep doing that then pay rises come they still get their fun money and they still I don't know, get a bit of a life later on. <laughs> yeah, we'll get access to kind of freer life later on. All right, I think mine is going to be fight the chemicals. Okay, so you, you're going to get, you're going to see the pay rise, you're going to get a dopamine hit because you're going to see this big number. And we need to squash those chemicals down with reality. So whatever number your pay rise is, if you're a higher rate taxpayer, basically, essentially half that number so if I was dishing out £7,000 pay rises and you're a higher rate taxpayer, you're going to get about an extra £3,500 a year and then break that down into months. If you're a basic rate taxpayer, you're getting to keep roughly about 70% of that £7,000. So hang on, that's seven, four, that's, so that's just £4,900 you're getting to keep, I think. Is that right? Give me a nod, people. Round about that. So work out the net amount. So as a basic rate taxpayer, you get about 70% of it. Higher rate taxpayer, you get about 50% of it. Then divide it by 12, and that's telling you how much richer you are per month and how that number makes you feel in comparison to the bigger number is going to be vastly different. And I'm going to hazard a guess that's going to temper some of your behaviour. And there is a calculator online, which I've actually had clients use. It's a free calculator, salary calculator, but it breaks down different pay over the year into weeks and months. So you can really clearly see the, the, the difference that that increase will make to you in terms of tax and national assurance, because it's all broken down in front of you. So it can be quite sobering, but it really does put it into perspective what, what difference that you think that large pay rise might make it may not be quite as pleasing as you'd like it to be. Is that the is that called the net salary calculator or something? No, I think it's just called it's salary just... calculator. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll use it quite often. If you were looking at how much extra you could put into your pension, it'll allow you to put a percentage in and then shows what your net pay would change to. And it often isn't significant. So it can encourage people to go actually I will pay a little bit extra into that because my take home doesn't massively change. Actually, one thing we haven't spoken about, I'm surprised it hasn't come up, but salary sacrifice. So if some, if your boss says, oh, I'm increasing your salary by 10%, what about saying to your boss, okay, well, I think I can just about manage on what I've got now. So that extra 10%, can you just pay it straight into my pension as an employer contribution instead? Which means you don't get taxed on it. So the 100% of it goes into your pension. And then you can say to him, oh, and do you know you're saving that national insurance that you would be paying if you were paying to me, it to me a salary? Can you put that in the pot as well? And then there you go, a really nice big fat pension contribution. And the same really would go for good point. bonuses as well, because I think we've got clients who have bonuses at a certain time of the year and the ability to put that into the pension can also help. Yeah, good point. Oh, we're adding value. I like that. Uh -huh. So in a nutshell, when I was telling you about the 7,000 pay rise and the fact that you don't get all of the 7,000 pound, if you go and do what Michelle and Emily just said, you get to keep all of the 7,000 pound. Mm -hmm.
Well, we have a lot of fun running the cafe. The reason we do it is to reach as many women as possible to empower them around money. So if you know a woman who would benefit from feeling financially empowered, you can help them and us by sharing this episode with them. All right, have we got any other tips on how to... Do you know what? I want to ask you a question, Michelle. Mm-hmm. All right, so if we could travel back in time, okay, and you you are the financial advisor to a 30-something Julie Flynn, <laughs> who's just got a pay rise, and her immediate thought is, great, I've got more money, I can buy more stuff. What would you be saying to me? I think I'd be saying to you to sit and have a look at what's important to you. What are those things that you have planned that you, you may have in your head that you want to do in a few years' time? But also alongside that, probably as you did quite sensibly, is what holes do you have in the things that should cover you now? And I think our insurances are so important to all of us. And that's one thing that clients sometimes really don't, they overlook because it's just something they feel they should have. But the true value of sitting down to you and going, what if this happened? What if that scenario happened? And actually, can we do something about it? So while you haven't got that extra money, you haven't had it, but you have now, that will give you peace of mind. It, it's less stress. So it's the what ifs and the what I'd like to do. And OK, how can we use that money to meet them? Yeah, and do you know what I think is really interesting? And it just shows you how messed up my relationship with money is. That it never occurred to me to try and keep hold of any of my money. And I had lived through some of the most serious what if events that you could think of. So, you know, the disaster planning. What if one of you gets cancer? What if? So we played that game and lost the game. And it still hadn't occurred to me mm. to start being more intentional with my money. It was very much a live for today thing. Mm. But I think some of those scenarios do make you want to live for the day. And that's what you've got to try and really pull back from and go, no, I have to be sensible. I I put a post on LinkedIn earlier in the week because I'd read the article about, her name's Hannah from S Club 7. And she's been homeless over Christmas. And she said one one sentence that she'd said just sort of really pulled on my heartstrings. It said, everyone just assumes that because I'm a pop star... I, I, you know, I had loads of really good money and I'm loaded. Well, and that was ages ago that she was a pop star. That ended ages ago. And of the money that she was earning at that point in her life when she was young and she was living for the day, well, there was nothing left. She would have massively let lifestyle creep happen. You know, she was young and impressionable and nobody was guiding her to say, no, actually, you should be saving for the future. This isn't going to last forever. Nobody did that. And yeah. And then also just to, you know, mention the the protection thing, you know, she's now ill, so she can't work. Well, if she'd put a protection policy in place when she was young and healthy, then again, that would have, there you go, you live and learn. You learn by other people's stories, but it's never going to happen to you, is it? That's what you tell yourself. Mm. Not going to happen to me. In terms of so what else we can do, I don't know what all your thoughts are on this, but, you know, one of the things that came to mind was, make a budget and I know this is something we've covered before and it can be whatever way that budget works for you because we're all different but I do feel that makes you more intentional with your money because you see where it's going and is it worth is it worth spending that extra money on those things or actually seeing it on paper would that make you more inclined to go actually let's save a bit more let's let's see that happening and the budget I think is one of the only ways you can see that I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Judy. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think something that I found with the clients that I work with that works really well hand in hand with that. So you've got this spending plan on the one hand, but it's then having a decision-making process to go alongside it. So a lot of my clients, they have a framework for making decisions about how they spend their money. So when it comes to something big, they've got this process that they can follow that makes sure that if they're thinking about making a big purchase, hang on, we need to go and get the decision-making process out. Grab some just a one page of A4, have a look at it, walk through the steps and the questions on it about the potential purchase. And they can sense check, is that in line with what I'm trying to achieve in my values? And it's really helpful, especially if you're in a couple, because it's maybe something that one person values and the other one doesn't. But we've got like this written agreement on how we make decisions about big purchases. 
and it's just it's a, it's an extra sense a sense check. Does that make it make it sound really boring? No, I Ooh, think it makes it sound great. Right. Yeah, what it should be. And I, you know, Jennifer, you were saying earlier. Obviously, you must see people's budgets all the time. Yeah. You know, and you, I assume that you would probably make them complete a budget. Does that make people start thinking? Have you seen that happen? Yeah, so see as part of our kind of fact-finding process, like we can go through a bit of a budget with our clients and go through the bank statements, but I always rather they do it because I think psychologically they view it very differently whenever they're going through it and going, I spend how much on food? Is that actually how much I spend on travel? Whereas I think we spend £100 in fuel and the little car is about 280 So seeing where the money goes, um, I think always helps people kind of reassess actually where they are in life. Yeah, I... And I think we do have things that help us with that. I know I recently found, I think, on my banking app, they had a subscriptions tab, which I'd never seen before. And I went into it, and it shows you what subscriptions are coming out, even though they're not direct debits, it still shows you regular payments to companies. And I actually, and I'll be honest, you know, I went, oh, I forgot about that. And I've been paying it every month. And what it does is it lets you block it. And then you can then go and actually cancel it once you realize that it's in place. And like you say, it's that in, intentional thing. You assume in your head, oh, I pay this much for food each month. When I actually sat and looked on my Lloyd's banking app and put in Tesco's, I nearly had heart failure. See what I always actually always a lot more, though. Yeah. It's, if not, people would think, oh, I can spend an extra, you know, 150, 200 pounds a month in the car. Particularly if they have no idea actually where their money goes and where the kind of holes are within the budget. So I think, yeah, always worthwhile doing a budget. And I've got quite sad. I've got like a cash flow one for my personal and for the business so that I know because it's like for the next 13 weeks for each of them. So I know exactly the things that come out, exactly what needs to come into the business and for me to kind of survive. So if I was to add on a few hundred pounds, that would probably unsettle me a bit. I don't think I would like that. Whereas if I didn't have that, I would have changed my car four times in the last year. But that's really interesting because I know when I changed my car last year, I went to the dealership and I said, I would, you know, I'd like another car, but I don't want to pay any more than what I'm paying. And he looked at me and he went, well, surely, you know, in, in time since you were here last, you've had a pay rise. And I said, well, I have. And he said, well, well, then you can afford more. I said, no, this is what I spend on a car. If you can't bring it in at that deal, I'm not going to have a car with you. <laughs> and, he, and he went away and he came back within 10p of my other payment. And I went, OK, that's fine. <laughs> I'll change my car. That probably gets a lot of people who will go, oh, yeah, you're right, I have had a pay rise. Yeah. So that makes complete sense that I'm going to allocate it here instead of going, oh, actually, no, it's better in my pocket than being tied to a commitment that, you know, loses its value. Yeah, definitely. Do you know, the other thing just occurred to me as well that I think may be kind of relevant to this as well is a couple of years ago, bought a new sofa on the interest-free credit thing, Magic. So I don't know if it was 12 or 18 months or whatever. But as we were getting towards the end of the term, I thought, well, that's a couple of hundred pounds that I've been used to spending each month. And that's about to arrive back in my bank account. And again, it's a bit like the pay rise. If I don't get intentional about it, it just gets swallowed up in cost or in dominoes or whatever else. <laughs> so I thought, so just, just before it was due to finish, I set up a standing order for that 200 pound to go into a savings account. So that it never actually touched my current account and it never really got to walk through the door of Costa or wherever, uh, wherever else it is I, I choose to waste my money. <laughs> but I, Yeah, that's one of the best things that you can do is make sure you've got a standing order or something in place. Because for me, before even, like as soon as I pay myself, a standing order goes out for savings because in my head it's a bill. And if I don't see it as that and I don't see it as this kind of recurring payment, I've spent it. Because you just see it as, oh, I can go and do those things because it's in your bank account instead of going, no, actually, future me will be really glad I've done that. Yeah, and I, with council tax, so council tax is only paid for 10 months of the year, isn't it? And I've got many friends who go, oh, that's great because February, March, I'm just going to have more money. And I have made, you know, each year I do, and it is intentional, I take that money and I put that in my savings account on February, you know, February and March, because to me, I would have spent it anyway. I'm going to have to in April, you know, in April, it's going to be back again. So if I can pull it out and forget I've put it there, that's amazing. Because if I leave it in my bank, I'll spend it. Now, and I think following up on from what Emily was saying, the mortgage or the pension, well, mortgage and pension. So I think this episode is coming out in February. So you are not paying council tax this month. 
So you can play this game with myself, Michelle and Jennifer. So what I'll do is one of the months, the money, that extra money will go into my pension and the other month, the money will go off my mortgage. Yeah. So in years gone by, I would have probably treated myself with some of that money. But as I got older, I got a little bit more sensible. Like we do. So, <laughs> so I think what, you, what we're doing here, trying to fight this lifestyle creep, is you're fighting against like the quick hit, aren't you? That dopamine hit and the easiness and the bit that feels fun. And it's like, sh- like a sugar rush, isn't it? And what we need to do is try and just calm those, those that central nervous system down so you can start making smart decisions. And I think what you were saying, Michelle and Jennifer, about automating your savings as well and taking the friction out of it, because it's dead easy to go and spend money. Let's make it just as easy to save money. Yeah. And I think it allows you to be in control of what your money is doing for you. And that's where a lot of you know, increased debt and increased stress comes from not having the control. And if you can take back control in any way you can with your money, surely that's got to be one of the most important things we can do, even if it's not about keeping up with the Joneses, just having control of it and knowing that you could deal with maybe something, an unexpected bill that might arrive or, you know, or be planning for a holiday. So if you want a holiday, that's fine, but put the money aside for it. Because if you start spending it on other things, it's never going to be there. And that's when you end up putting it on a credit card or you you end up getting a loan for it because you booked the holiday, but you didn't put the money aside mm. for it. So, yeah, it just makes you more resilient. Do you know what, as well, it is, it's, it is kind of satisfying as well. So you've got that quick hit of going out and spending stuff. But it's like a slow release drug with the satisfaction of knowing that you've been sensible with your money and you're building long-term security. So, I don't know. It, it, I'm not saying it's not fun at all, because it is. It can be really rewarding doing sensible things with your money. But you can still do the fun things. You're just planning for it, aren't you? Yes. Rather than being impulsive, you know, we all have impulsive moments. And I think if we've all had issues that have happened in our life and you go, well, actually, I deserve it. I only live once. Let's go and get it. You could still have that. It's just more delayed and more controlled rather than the impulse coming in and you buying, I don't know, the latest Apple Watch because you were out and you suddenly had money in your account and it was burning a hole and you buy it. And then a month later you go, I don't really use it. Why have I got it? That's from experience, by the way. So I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> oh, no, that, that story did have that ring to it. <laughs> and then I ended up selling it because I didn't need it. And I've lost money on it, obviously, because it was secondhand. So it was an impulse. I, I had a bit of money and it was there. And I thought, no, I'm going to treat myself. But it just didn't work. I actually felt awful afterwards because I never used it. It just kept telling mm. me to keep moving and my heart rate was too high. So. <laughs> that does not sound like fun at all. <laughs> so just as we as we bring this episode to a close then, I'm just wondering, Jennifer, what's been your biggest takeaway from the conversation? I think making sure you're looking at any increase or your money in general with a lot of intention. I think making sure that it covers all the bases for what you need it to, but that it's also going to be working for you in the future so that you can hopefully stop the impulse buying. All right. And Michelle, what about yourself with regards to takeaway? Knowing where my money goes, because if I know where it goes, I can be, again, goes back to being intentional about how I spend it in the future. And there may be much more exciting things that I can plan in the future than having a a better car or, or whatever now. No, I think I think they're really, really important. And so, so hopefully you've found this episode thought provoking. So we know that we're in February and March, so we know th- we we know there's less money going out your bank account this month because it's happening to all of us. If you're going to do something different with that money that you wouldn't normally do, that's I'm going to do air quotes sensible, then why don't you drop us a message and let us know what you've been inspired to do? But it just remains for me to say thank you to Michelle. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. I would say thank you to Emily, but Emily's had to pop off early, so I'm sure Emily's very grateful as well for you listening. But thank you very much for listening to us, and until next time, take care of yourself. Thanks for listening to the Women & Money Cafe. If you've enjoyed it, 
please leave us a review. It really does help. And also please note the podcast is for education and information only and doesn't constitute personal financial advice. Please reach out to one of us or any of the other fantastic financial advisors in the UK for that kind of help.